Thank you, Chair. Uh, gentlemen, can I ask you if you are aware of the testimony of Professor Bill Black to the inquiry? Yeah. Yes. Um, and in his testimony, Professor Black, who was a renowned regulator and prosecutor of financial institutions that failed in the United States, said <clears throat> that there was a recipe which banks followed, which that if banks followed, which would, quote, produce the worst losses and is most likely to cause hyperinflated bubbles. And that recipe includes grow like crazy, and he mentions 25%, and he mentions growth way ahead of e economic uh, growth nationally, and also make terrible quality loans. And Professor Black, you will have seen, said three sure things follow. Record profits for the institution, then, quote, second, under modern executive compensation, the senior leadership will promptly be made wealthy, and three, catastrophic losses. Now, gentlemen, can I ask you both, in view of the fact that Allied Irish Bank's growth in 2004 in this balance sheet was 25%, 37.5 percent in 2005. The bank made record profits in those years. The remuneration of senior personnel was at record levels. And then there followed a huge crash. Do you recognize Professor Black's analysis in terms of Allied Irish Bank, and do you agree with it? Um, Thank you, Deputy. Um, I think most of Professor Black's uh, observations were based uh, on his US experience, and he did make references to liar loans and, and, and the like. Uh, in general terms, you know, he is trying to transfer the, his US observations into, into the Irish market. Um, when you look at you know, what he said, if you do grow loans, and there is a market crash, which is a one in 100 year event, banks are going to suffer greatly. Uh, banks absorb the risk between short money and long money. And when there's a, a problem of that nature, it will materialize in falling asset values and problems for banks. So in general, I agree with his observations uh, in AIB. Uh, our economy was, in those years, held up as probably the highest performing economy in the world. Our demographics were totally different to the market that he was drawing reference to. Uh, so some of his analogies you know, are right, but I think his, the basis from which he is extrapolating one, one observation to another is fundamentally unsound because it was a different, totally different economy. Yes, bri briefly, thank you. In respect to that, I, I'd be very brief. The, the point I would make, I've made in my opening statement, which is that um, in, in the period that I'm talking about up to this time, 2005, you know, we, we were in, we as in the economy was in a big, big catch-up phase. I mean, you can't ignore the fact, sorry, one can't ignore the fact that the population did increase by a million over, over that period of 71 to 2001 that the labor force had increased by 32%, that the employed population had increased by um, 49%. I mean, people had to be housed, they had to go shopping, they were moving into urban areas from the country on a continuous basis. So I think the Irish economic situation was a bit different to, if you like, the model that I, I have read his but testimony. But that he would be can, can I put it to you, gentlemen, that already by the 1990s, there was a substantial body of, of, of study of banking crisis internationally, which had all the features virtually of what happened in Ireland. Um, Mr. Black, for example, supplements or his analysis supplemented by an article written in 1993 by two Berkeley professors, one of whom, uh, George Akerlof, is a Nobel laureate, 
I don't expect you, and I, I, my question isn't predicated on you having read this article. It is referred to by uh, Professor Black in his evidence, the article in question, looting the economic underworld of bankruptcy for profit, lays out precisely the strategy I have discussed. I quote from that article, our theoretical analysis shows that an economic underground can come to life if firms have an incentive to go broke for profit at society's expense, in brackets to loot, instead of to go for broke, in brackets to gamble on success. Bankruptcy for profit will occur if poor accounting, lax regulation, or low penalties for abuse give owners an incentive to pay themselves more than their firms are worth and then default on their debt obligations. Bankruptcy for profit occurs most commonly when a government guarantees a firm's debt obligations. That was in 1993. Mr. Sheikh, could I ask you why, considering the, the substantial body of literature that exists and analysis, which I don't have time to go into, why were you chief regulators or, or uh, risk officers, and indeed yourselves, the senior officers, were you aware of this analysis? of banking crisis, even Sweden a few years before you came into... Yeah, below time for a response yes. as well. The question well is wh wh why would you not have been aware of this, or were you? Um, the premise of your question was that people go into banks to loot the bank, or loot the shareholders, or loot the state. I was just quoting the... Yes, but you quoted to me, and you framed the question from the quote. That is not the case, never was the case. The people in the bank that I had the privilege of working with, by and large, almost entirely, totally committed to doing a good job and having a long career in the bank. That was what people, that's what motivated people. I have never met anybody in the bank, or in any of most of the other banks that I've met, who had anything other than a long-term, stable, repeat business, grow your market share stay there for the long haul. That's the way people operate in the bank. And all the records and all the references in any of the documents you'd have seen would confirm that. Um, Mr. Shee, Professor Black says that, that there is a perverse incentive for senior executives to increase the balance sheet because it's linked to their salary and bonuses. The record of AIB annual reports will show that your remuneration substantially increased along with a substantial increase in the balance sheet growth. Was Professor Black correct? He wasn't. Uh, as I explained earlier on, the remuneration of the Chief Executive Officer, me, when I was there, was based on market comparisons and norms. I told the remuneration committee on the board, and they knew it very clearly, as did the director, as did the, the chairman, that I wanted my salary to be the lowest in its peer group relative to the size of the bank. And that's in, in the Nyberg report, page 7. There's a chart with there. So there was no relationship, none whatsoever, between my salary and the size of the bank's balance sheet. That's a fact. If you can, you can look up the remuneration committee notes. You can look up the terms of the remuneration committee, the factors that went into it, the discussions at the board. There is no connection or validity to what you're asserting. Um, Mr. Shee, between 2005-2009, you, you earned in salary and bonuses 7.6 million, which would take an industrial worker 190 years to earn. Um, in view of the apology you made and the mistakes that were made, which you said. Uh, did you consider giving a contribution? Did you consider giving a contribution to the taxpayer uh, from uh, from that uh, uh, amount of money? And lastly, uh, uh, you were obviously a substantial lender to homeowners, owner occupiers. Um, the fact that the price of a home was increasing by the equivalent of the average industrial wage each year from 1996 to 2006, putting young people by common consent in a dreadful situation of up to 40 year mortgages, unsustainable loans. Me, did, time did that ever occur to response. you as a moral issue? The difficulties that young generation was being put in by the profits that were being made? Uh, you asked me five questions. I'll try to. I paid tax on everything I earned. 
I made, I made a voluntary reduction in my pension after I left um, in relation to the credit worthiness of first-time buyers. We followed a strategy of uh, not following the market. We had, I think, 151,000 mortgages, 2,660 were 100 per cent finance, which is less than 2 per cent. The market was 8 per cent. We monitored on a monthly basis what a standard application coming into our counter would be vis-a-vis -vis all our competitors, and it was always the lowest. We changed it a little bit towards the end. Uh, and if you looked at the published information as at the 31st of December 2010, uh, in AIB, the 90-day past due rate for mortgages, and that's 90-day past due is not an opinion, it's a fact. You have to be 90-day past due to be 90-day past due was 2.5 per cent, which was the, by far the lowest in the market. Subsequently, it changed when the bank merged with EBS, who had a different rate. But I think the mortgage process in AIB was best in class. The numbers uh, substantiate that. Do you agree that the level of... You're completely and totally out of time, and I need to come back to a question now that we need to ask.